Good afternoon, everyone. Please have a seat. My name is Marilyn Martell. I'm the Senior Assistant Vice Chancellor for Marketing and Communications, and it is my honor to serve as your MC for this groundbreaking celebration. There's a spirit that can ne'er be told. It's the spirit of Aggieland. How very true those words are. And today we celebrate Aggies past, present, and future as we come together to break ground on what will be the home for undergraduate engineering education. We're joined today by several special guests and I would like to take a moment to introduce them. As I call your name, if you would please stand and remain standing and then we will acknowledge them all as a group with our applause. To my right, on behalf of the Texas A&M University Board of Regents, Chairman Phil Adams, <laughs> I still don't miss you very well. <laughs> Regent Elaine Mendoza, Regent Judy Morgan, Regent Charles Schwartz, and Regent Jim Schwartner. <laughs> to my left, representing Texas State House District 14, the Honorable John Rainey, Texas A&M System Chancellor John Sharp, Vice Chancellor and Dean of Engineering M. Catherine Banks, and Provost and Executive Vice President Karen Watson. Thank you all for joining us. Every building has a story, and the Zachary Engineering Center is no exception. As one of the most utilized buildings on this campus, there have been roughly 50,000 Aggies that have had classes in that building since 1972. As we prepare to close down the Zachary building next month to begin the construction project, we have encouraged all who have a connection to this building to share their favorite memories with us to be included in a time capsule. The response has been overwhelming. Our post on TechSags, which is an online forum for discussion of all things A&M, has had over 10,000 hits. We've had hundreds of comments posted on our social media channels, and the memories of this building vary wildly. We've had first day of class foibles, we've had many cases of people meeting their future spouse, and there's a handful of children that have been named Zachary because of their parents' time in this building. We, we in fact, we in fact uh, have <laughs> brought this time capsule here today where these memories will be stored. And we have asked our speakers today if they would like to conclude their remarks by depositing their favorite memories in this time capsule, that would be wonderful. And if they'd like to share them with us, that would be even better. Upon conclusion of this event, you are all welcome to come and leave your memories in this time capsule. We will be opening it in 50 years I don't think I'll be here for that. Perhaps some of our younger people will. There is also a wheelbarrow up here at the front that you'll see, and that is filled with pieces of the familiar concrete aggregate that is filling up the Zachary building. If you leave a memory, please feel free to take a piece of the Zachary building with you. Our first speaker was a student at Texas A&M during the time the Zachary Building was under construction. A 1970 graduate with a bachelor's degree in science, he went on to own and operate a successful insurance company, serving his second six-year term as a regent and currently serving as its chair. Please join me in welcoming Texas A&M University System Board of Regents Chairman Phil Adams. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Howdy. Howdy. And good afternoon. And I'm going to come clean with you. Marilyn said uh, a degree in science. My second degree was in uh, biology, but the first one was PE. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean petroleum engineering. <laughs> Mark Fisher on the one of our great Aggie engineers, Tim Leach, I see so many, Ralph Cox, I can't, Artie McFerrin, too many to mention, uh, laughing, and, and they know, they know that, but uh, there were a lot of good things, a lot of good things going on over in PE in those days. 
and I, I see Mark here, I think, but Stalins was killing us. That's one of, one of the things that was going on, Coach Stalins. Um, it's great to be here today, and I, I stand before you on behalf of the Board of Regents of our great Texas A&M University system. We're so pleased to be a part of this wonderful groundbreaking and this very special new engineering education complex. I think a lot of people, when they think about A&M, talk about A&M, the first thing that comes to mind is Aggie football, and I get it. But a close second is Aggie engineering. A&M produces the best engineers in the world. We're, we're known all over and revered all over for our engineering. This room is full of our leaders. Aggie engineers are smart, innovative, creative, competitive. They're proud of their university and they're proud of this outstanding engineering program. Today as we look to the future, we also embrace the past, sharing our memories of the Zachary Engineering Center and all the engineers who have learned their craft in this building. It served the students and the faculty well over these past decades. You think about the name, the great Zachary family, H.B. Pat, Pat Zachary, Bartell and Molly, who many of us know, John Zachary, I know, is with us today. Uh, what a great family, what a great leader as all of you in this room are for Aggie Engineering. Looking ahead, this new building will serve as a place for Aggie engineers of tomorrow to learn, to study, and to grow. Times have changed, technology has changed, and we must change and adapt to stay competitive. One thing's for sure though, one thing will not change, and that's the dedication that we all have to this university and the dedication that engineering has and this university has to producing the best engineers in the world. Thank you, Dr. Banks, for your great leadership. Thank you for your wonderful, this wonderful engineering council and our engineering leaders out here who continue to commit so much of your resources, financial and otherwise. Thank you so much. Again, it's great to be with you today and we're very, very proud of engineering at Texas A&M. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Adams, and thank you all the regents for joining us today. The Texas A&M University System is one of the largest university systems in the nation with 11 universities and seven state agencies. Our next speaker has served as chancellor of the A&M system since 2011, and prior to that, spent more than three decades of his career in public service. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science at Texas A&M in 1972, and was elected student body president. To deliver greetings on behalf of the A&M system, please welcome Chancellor John Sharp. Howdy. Howdy. This is what happens when you pick a dean that is the best in the country, that has the vision and the courage to follow that dream to the very end, letting nothing stay in its way. This is what happens when you have a Board of Regents that believes in that dean, follows that dean, and does what's necessary and makes the tough decisions. And this is what happens when people like you put your time, talent, and money behind the vision of that dean. You create not only the largest, but the best engineering school in the United States of America. This is a dean that woke up one day and said, look what we're doing in engineering. All of these schools out here think they're top 10 and they can't be more than 10,000. Never mind the fact that every CEO of every corporation on planet Earth has always said, America, better wake up. Better start producing more engineers. 
Singapore is passing this, China is passing this in different places. She decided that the cocoon that all of these universities were safely ensconced in wasn't going to be uh, exist anymore at Texas A&M University. And she decided that she was going to do what every president of the United States has said, every CEO, we're going to produce engineers. Just as this university is going to save the world when the next pandemic hits, we are saving the world when it comes to producing the kind of engineers that this country needs. Kathy Banks is remarkable. She scares me, really, but she is. <laughs> But she is a remarkable dean, and this board and you following her is going to produce the finest engineering school that exists on planet Earth, period. Thank you, Kathy, for what you do. Now I want to tell you a little story. Back when I was controller of public accounts, an old ag told his son, said, I want you to pick old Sharp up whenever he lands in Houston and drive him wherever he needs to be and stuff like that. So this young man who had just graduated from in engineering from Texas A&M, every time I flew into Houston, he'd pick me up at Hobby or wherever it was and drive me to whatever speech I had and stuff like that. And then two nights ago, I get a call saying that my driver has given the lead gift in engineering for Texas A&M's new engineering school. And, you know, the, the recovering politician in me for the last two days is going, what did I tell John Zachary to convince him 30 years ago, 20 years ago to do this? This is a joke, of course. Um, thank all of you for what you have done. This is a remarkable place. Have you noticed that the other universities that at, at the beginning said, oh, my God, we can't do that because it's going to lower quality, never mind SAT scores went up in the freshman class 30-something points after you put another thousand kids in there. Have you noticed that the other universities are now trying to figure out to do what you and this board and Kathy Banks is doing in this country? We're doing what land-grant universities do best, and that is service to our country and producing the kind of engineers that this country and this state needs. Congratulations to every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Sharp. Texas A&M Engineering is one of the largest programs in the country and consistently ranked among the top 10 public engineering programs. Our next speaker is responsible for this program, as well as the coordination and collaboration among the three engineering state agencies in the A&M system. She's also the reason we are here today because of her vision, her passion, and her energy that have driven this project since its inception. Please welcome Texas A&M Engineering Vice Chancellor and Dean, Dr. Kathy Banks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very kind words. Um, I am so pleased to be here today. It, it means such a great deal to me to see so many friends of Texas A&M Engineering joining us. Thank you all for coming. You know, if you've been around academe for any length of time, you know how our culture tends to bring great ceremony to events like this. Uh, you may have wondered whether all the hoopla was, was reasonable. You may ask yourself, what's the big deal? We, we break ground on facilities all the time. But let me assure you, this one is different. This one is important because it's time we break the mold. Our students today are not the same learners you and I were. They've grown up with instant access to a boundless universe of information that's available at their fingertips in real time. They don't experience the world the same way we do. They certainly aren't programmed to learn in the same way we did. To continue teaching them, as we do now, with the strict classic constructs that have existed for hundreds of years, is short-sighted at best and silly at worst. Raymond Kurzweil, who's a popular futurist, explains it this way. At the rate that technology is advancing, we won't experience 100 years of progress in the 21st century. It will be more like 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. Within a few decades, machine intelligence will surpass human intelligence. 
leading to technological change so rapid and profound that it represents a rupture in the very fabric of human history. So if our world is changing so rapidly, why is academe so stagnant? Why do we continue to educate students without embracing the new tools of technology? I believe that no longer is incremental change acceptable. We must transform the existing evolutionary approach to engineering education and instead mount a revolutionary disruption. The vision for the engineering education complex is to create an environment that changes the status quo to provide a technology integrated educational facility that optimizes modern pedagogical techniques and engages students with hands-on experiential learning opportunities. Every aspect of this new facility places Texas A&M at the forefront of this educational shift. But our success will not be measured by an on-time completion of this building. Our success will be the transformation of the educational processes used by those inside the building. Winston Churchill captured this sentiment best when he said, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. My hope is that this building will be the home of curiosity and imagination, a place where a young woman from South Texas feels the pride of her ideas being well received by her peers, a place where students make lifelong friends working side by side throughout the night on a design project, not because they have to, because they want to a place that comes to mind when our graduates reflect on their college years and how every class, every failure, and every success made them who they are. More than a mere building, the ed engineering education complex will be a portal of transformation. There are those who said we shouldn't take on this challenge, that construction of this type of building was not feasible in the Texas A&M campus, that we would never raise funds required for private donations that we could not grow our engineering program and provide a high quality educational experience, and that we should not interfere with the tried and true traditional educational model, even though we face the need for a future workforce with skills that none of us, none of us can even fathom today. I heard many reasons why we shouldn't move forward, but I was reminded of a quote by Texan Jim Hightower, who said, the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. Even a dead fish can go with the flow. <laughs> We're here today because of the Aggie can-do spirit. Even when state funds are in very short supply for academic buildings, the chancellor and the regents stepped forward and supported this project. Our former students stepped forward and contributed over $58 million for this project, the most donations ever raised for an academic building in the history of Texas A&M. Our current students stepped forward and pledged $1 million for this building, more than any other student group has contributed for a building project. Our faculty from departments stepped forward and are dedicating significant time and effort to design the next generation of classroom and laboratories. Together, today, we are breaking ground on our future. In closing, I thank all of you for having the courage, as Aggies always have, to rise to the challenge to join us as we continue our tradition of leadership for the next generation of Aggie engineers. The Zachary Building is considered the heart of the engineering program, so in planning for today's ceremony, we felt it was very important to reflect on the past, the present, and the future. Our next speaker is a former student whose successful career path to some degree was launched within the walls of the Zachary Building. After earning a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 1980, he went on to become a decorated NASA astronaut and worked with the Space Shuttle and International Space Station programs. A veteran of three space flights, he's logged more than 194 days in space, including more than 48 hours outside the craft in seven spacewalks. Please join me in welcoming Mike Fossum. Howdy. Howdy. Hey, what an honor it is today to be here, part of this Aggie history. 
You know, as we stand here at the beginning of a new chapter of engineering excellence at Texas A&M, I can't help but think a little bit about how engineering and technology have changed our world and what it was like back when the Zachary Engineering building next to us here uh, was brand new. Now, a lot has changed since Zachary opened in 1972, but a few things have stayed the same. The fish are still traumatized by their first calculus class. Uh, students who don't get enough sleep at night, often wearing uniforms, uh, might still find the back row a comfortable place to catch a nap. And uh, 100,000 Aggie engineers, most of whom came through this building, are still known worldwide as professionals who excel at solving problems to make the world a better place. I showed up a few years after Zachary opened its doors. I was a bright-eyed freshman with a desire to become one of those Aggie engineers and also with an improbable dream of flying in space. When I walked into Zachary for the first time, I was mesmerized by the large Foucault pendulum that was hanging in the lobby there. It's been long gone now, but it was rotating in response to the Earth's rotation. It took me years to understand the equations associated with that. The building itself was a showplace of engineering and technology and innovation. The halls were crowded with students, and you could roam into the different departments to talk to advisors who were eager to show you their labs full of cool toys and to convince you to pursue a future in their department. Now, life was a bit different back then for, for the students and really for all of us. Cars got about 8 to 12 miles per gallon and gasoline cost less than 50 cents a gallon. Artificial limbs were crude strap-on appendages, and pacemakers and artificial hearts didn't exist. Students had calculators, but they were called slide rules. They didn't have batteries. Computers of the day literally filled up rooms. Writing computer code meant painstakingly punching uh, lines of code onto computer punch cards, like this one, 80 characters, okay? And then you carried the, all of these cards together, you had to very carefully keep them in order, and you'd carry them over to the central campus computing facility, hand over your box, and then you prayed that the program would run. A computing disaster in those days was dropping the box and scattering the cards. <laughs> now, word processors hadn't been invited yet, so research papers were carefully typed on manual typewriters. Calls home to mom and dad to complain and maybe to ask for more money had to wait until Sunday night at 11 p.m. when the long distance charges were the lowest. Mail from home, hopefully with a check inside, uh, arrived at a P.O. box in the MSC. Good cameras were about the size of a quarter loaf of bread. Now science fiction showed us images of a, of a miniature pocket communicator. You know, today that fantasy is real, right? They even include the camera. They've made the P.O. box almost obsolete. And mom can use hers to transfer money to your bank account while she's sitting at a red light in her 40 mile per gallon car. The Star Trek cloaking devices, we call them stealth technology. The real devices, there's real devices out there like the Star Trek uh, tricorder. They're used to assess a patient's pulse, heart rhythm, temperature, and blood oxygenation in seconds. We also just launched our first replicator to the ISS, to the space station, in the form of a 3D printer. All of these things were barely imaginable 40 years ago, and they've dramatically changed our lives and our world for the better, and that's just scratching the surface. Now in the realm of spaceflight, I watched with excitement through the Apollo years, through the moon landings, and dreamed about someday helping put the first human footprints on Mars. But in the mid-70s, we seemed to have kind of stalled out. The Skylab space station fell back to Earth as it waited for the much-delayed space shuttle to arrive to give it the push to a higher orbit. The space shuttle did eventually flew and had an amazing record over its 30-year life, although we learned some really hard lessons along the way. That space station was key to building the amazing International Space Station that we have today. This orbiting laboratory weighs over 900,000 pounds and it just barely fits down into Kyle Field from end to end. Its internal volume is about the same as 12 school buses or a Boeing 747. Our ongoing research and hundreds of uh, scientific investigations are reaping benefits in human health, material science, 
combustion, plant growth, robotics, and many others. At the same time, we're learning to develop and operate systems that we'll need to reach out beyond low Earth orbit. Perhaps most importantly, we're doing this in a, with a 15 partner nations, and we're proving that countries can, can set aside their personal agendas and disagreements and work together in cooperation for common goals. Now today, with these shovels, we start a new chapter in the continuing story. Engineering and technology have changed our world and have also brought challenges with it to be cleaner, more efficient, less expensive, more competitive. What science fiction or dreams of today will the students who learn their trade in this new engineering education complex turn into reality in the next 40 years? Can artificial limbs become indistinguishable from the human original? Are there new energy sources waiting to be tapped? Can we produce agriculture in all areas of the planet? Will we discover how to efficiently turn seawater into drinking water on a massive scale? Is it possible to integrate devices with the human brain to actually enable sight, hearing, and speech? Can we build a functioning space elevator using nanotechnology or other new materials? Will human spaceflight ever be as safe and routine as climbing onto an airliner? Now, if I could ask the students in here that are going to be working on these things, for one bit of improvement to our space program, I'd like to put some emphasis on that would be the transporter, because it'd be really nice to come home for the weekend once in a while. <laughs> Again, with these shovels, we symbolically start the preparation of the foundation for the EEC. Now, the more massive and impressive you want to build up, the more work you have to do to prepare that foundation. It's a long ways to bedrock around here, and so we improvise with concrete, steel, rebar tied together, fused to provide stability in a shifting, unsteady landscape. This new hallmark of, engineering, of Aggie Engineering Excellence, the EEC, will not just have a solid foundation, hidden beneath its walls, classrooms, and labs, it will provide a solid foundation for generations of Aggie engineers to come. These Aggie engineers are going to need the stability of both that quality education they get right here in the EEC and the rock-solid Aggie core values we hold dear. Excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Their education and values will be their foundation as they move into the far less certain world beyond Aggieland. A rocket cannot stand ready at the pad, ready to start its mission without a solid, immovable base beneath it. I like to think the EEC will be the launch pad for Aggies to go forth boldly, to take on the challenges ahead, to turn dreams into realities, and to make the United States and the world a better place. My hat is off to the students and the engineering council who contributed the first $1 million to get this project started, and to the pioneer donors who are firmly committed to making this dream become a reality. I have never been more proud to be a Texas Aggie engineer, and I'm excited about the endless possibilities ahead. God bless, gig em, and beat the hell out of Mizzou. <laughs> I, I would like to place my token into the time capsule here. This is a, my uh, mission patch when I was the first Aggie commander in space. I look forward to the next many Aggie commanders in space to follow my footsteps. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your unique perspective. Our next speaker represents the current student perspective and is the embodiment of Aggie Corps values. A true leader, he's a member of the Corps of Cadets, Ross Volunteers, and serves as an ambassador for the university in his role as a maroon coat. An industrial distribution major from Bernie, Texas, and a member of the class of 2014, please welcome our student body president, Kyle Kelly. Well, howdy. howdy. 
It is so exciting to, to be here today. I've seen a video of Mr. Fossum from space in Kyle Field a few years ago, uh, and I know uh, the Fossum's son, John Fossum, was in my outfit, Squadron 17, which is actually um, a living memorial to the Challenger uh, space shuttle and the seven astronauts who were um, tragically killed there. So it's, uh, it's tough to, to follow. We've had an exciting month. I, earlier this week, um, spoke just following um, Congressman Bill Flores, and I uh, never thought that I would have to speak after a rocket scientist and an astronaut, but uh, that is uh, today. But it has been a great month. We've celebrated two weeks ago voting in uh, our elected leaders in this country. Uh, we honor and remember um, all of our veterans who have made possible uh, the United States of America and Texas A&M University in the exciting um, adventure that we uh, begin uh, today. And so it's, a, it's an incredible month. Uh, it's a very, very exciting time at Texas a and i I'm here um, to represent on behalf of the current student body, so many current students um, who are so fortunate to have the opportunity to be here. And I've always started out from welcoming nearly 7,000 freshmen um, through fish camp this, this summer uh, to what is our largest historic class at Texas a and uh, with some basic things and just a small glimpse uh, into the history of Texas a and being the first in Texas of course, founded in 1876 as a land-grant institution. Um, this project is so Aggie. We're a land-grant university um, founded to meet uh, mechanical and agricultural needs originally, and also that of the, for the military. Uh, we've grown to now be the third largest student body in the country. Um, we're a tier one research university with triple federal distinctions as now a land, sea, and space grant university. Um, a member of the Association of American Universities. Um, the purpose of, of Texas A&M is to develop leaders of character uh, who are dedicated to serving the greater good. Uh, and the military, many know, again, a look into the past, we commissioned more officers in World War II than the combined totals of the U.S. military academies. Uh, one, one fact, the Wall Street Journal, uh, now most students go to work, said that Texas A&M students were second most sought after by Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, and nonprofits. Um, people want to hire fighting Texas Aggies, and for a lot of reasons. We're known for a lot of things. When I ask uh, incoming students what we're known for uh, at Texas A&M, it's extremely profound what they tell me. I, I say, what are we known for? Uh, what do you think the first thing that they say is? Johnny Manziel. Uh, so we're known for Johnny Manziel, and I agree. There's, there's uh, certainly athletics, but we're actually known for a lot more than that. We're the friendliest campus in the country, the happiest. Some say we're the fittest. Uh, a lot talked about over the summer. Something came out about A&M's contribution to public good. Um, we're known for Aggie engineering. We're known for being uh, individuals that, uh, that accept the challenges, have vision for the future, um, and seek to solve um, and give solutions to the problems in our world. Um, we're known for, for all of those things, and it's an extremely exciting thing uh, to be a part of um, uh, as a current student. And so, uh, you know, I'm very proud of, of my peers in, in uh, getting this started. I did want to mention the Student Engineering Council giving the first million. Um, I've had a privilege and opportunity to get to know uh, many of the faces that I see that have financially made possible um, this, this project and this initiative. Um, and I am so grateful um, as, a, as a current student, um, as an Aggie, um, for the contributions that you've made. And this is an amazing place. The education, second to none. Known for so many things. Uh, and, and there is no better place to get uh, the education and experience than Texas A&M. And this is um, only the start and only, only the beginning. Um, I've given uh, speeches in many capacities um, over this year in serving as student body president, but I've always ended, there is no better place uh, to be than Texas A&M, and there's very few better times to be here than right now, and it's very, very exciting. And thank you so much. God bless, and gig them. Thank you, Kyle. You're a tremendous representative of your fellow students. We've heard the perspective of a former student, of a current student. What would this event look like through the eyes of a future engineering student? Well, we're about to find out. Please join me in welcoming a high school senior from Warren, Texas, who recently found out he will be joining us as an engineering student next fall, Chase McCatherine. Howdy. Howdy. Thank you for having me today. It is truly an honor. I've always done that I'd like to build things. Uh, 
take them apart, see how they work, and hopefully put them back together again. <laughs> when I was small, I spent hours on end with my grandfathers in their shops, <clears throat> building things, taking apart boat parts, and fixing cars. These are some of my most cherished memories. When I was a freshman in high school, I joined our school's first robotics team. This was an amazing experience. By sophomore year, our, our robotics team advanced to the world competition in St. Louis, Missouri. My sm tiny, small town school competed against, not only against teams all, from all over the US, but from teams all over the world. <clears throat> that moment during that competition, I knew that I would be, <clears throat> I knew that I would want to be an engineer. I knew that I could build things, important things, that would help make a difference in the world around me. My sophomore year was also the year that I competed here in the state livestock judging competition. From, from the moment I set foot on this campus, I knew that I had found a home and that Texas A&M would be where I wanted to pursue my future. This summer, during my, during my prospective student visit, I had the chance to visit the Zachary Building to take in the history of surrounding the building and the engineering program. I was completely in awe of all the distinguished histories of all who have come through these doors before me. <clears throat> this program has produced some amazing contributions to Texas A&M, College Station, the nation, and beyond. This program has produced some amazing engineers who have, <clears throat> who have done some truly astounding things for our world. When I think about these former students that walk through these doors, learning and growing just, uh, just as I will next fall, <clears throat> I realize that I have some big footsteps to follow in. Texas A&M University, and specifically Texas A&M Engineering, has a rich tradition of both educational excellence and of giving back to the Aggie family. But that's what I love about Texas A&M Engineering. It's a family. It's hard work, but it is worth it in the end when you see the results of those labors and i can't wait to watch these, this new building go up and learn from the out, outstanding professors in this program this groundbreaking marks the end of an era but it also marks the beginning of a new one it starts and ends here i know and i am so honored and proud to be a part of it thanks and gig em. Thank you so much, Chase, for coming up to speak with us today. We look forward to welcoming you as a freshman, and I think you're going to do just fine. All right, the time has come to close one chapter and open a new one in the Zachary Building story with the ceremonial breaking of ground for new construction. I would like to invite the stage party to please move down to the prepared site for a photograph. And as they make their way forward, I would like to also invite our lead gift donors to please come forward and join the stage party in the first turning of the soil. Mark and Susu Fisher, Tim and Amy Leach, and John Zachary unfortunately had a family commitment and had to slip out. But if you would all please come down for the turning.
I'm sorry, we're not very organized with the turning of the shovel. A few more photographs. We would like to also have some of our pioneer donors have an opportunity to dig and turn in the soil. So as this group is returning to their seats, I would like to invite our engineering keystone and pillar level donors to please come forward. Representing Craig and Galen Brown Foundation, Craig Brown, Conoco Phillips and Bill Bullock, Dorothy and Artie McFerrin, the Baker Hughes Foundation, David Craig, Dow Chemical Company Foundation, Jeff Gary, Linda and Joe Fowler, Earl Nye, Philip 66, Robin Brown, and the Student Engineers Council, Melinda McClure. And Pam Green will be coordinating the countdown for the photographer. And we would now like to invite our Engineering Foundation and Spirit Level donors forward. Jim Craddock and Rosetta Resources, Bobby Jean and Corky Frank, Daryl Heath, Baker Lee Shannon, Linda and Del Whitaker, Brad Warsham, the Outstanding Senior Engineers, Craig Brown, and Ralph Cox, please come forward.
And finally, the engineering education complex will be a multidisciplinary environment for learning. And what better way to symbolize the joint ownership by all disciplines than to bring all of the department heads forward for our final turning of the soil and photo. Would all department heads please come forward. This concludes our program. You are all welcome to stay and enjoy some refreshments that are located at the back of the tent. You are also welcome to come up. We have strips of paper and pens and leave your memories in the Zachary time capsule. Don't forget, you're welcome to take a piece of Zachary with you. Hopefully none of the foundational support pieces are in this wheelbarrow. And again, I would like to thank all of our pioneer donors. Without you, we couldn't have done this. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great weekend.